Um, our next guest speaker is an economist, an accountant, a psychologist and a clinical criminologist, an expert in the early years. He's currently advising Dame Andrea Ledsam MP, who's reviewing early years policy for UK government. It gives me great pleasure to welcome from Wave Trust, George Hosking. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for the invitation to speak today. I've been sharing conferences with Mark for 15 years now, and I've never had once heard him speak without learning something new and important on the subject of ACEs. Thank you, Mark. Yet again, you have educated me, as you are constantly doing. It's always a pleasure to work with you. I'm going to talk about prevention. Prevention is better than cure. We all know that. The only problem is hardly any local authority in Britain actually practices prevention rather than cure. We spend massively much more money on cure than we do in prevention. We're going to talk today about trauma-informed care, so we should. WAVE is supporting six local authorities in Britain today to implement trauma-informed care. We're only supporting one to do prevention before the ACEs happen in the first place. Yet it's possible, and that's what I want to show you today. If my clicker will only work and move things on. So we learned a lot about this through two studies we carried out. One in 2005, violence and what to do about it. One in 2013, jointly with the Department for Education, conception to age two, the age of opportunity. When we ran our first study on violence, we discovered that there were two major factors in violence the individual's propensity to be violent, that's inside the individual, and the social factors which triggered violence. There are more than 50 social factors we could identify which trigger violence. But what we found was they only trigger violence in individuals who have the inner propensity. Many people get drunk and don't become violent because they're drunk. Many people, including people in this room, watch violent television, but don't become violent through watching violent television. But people with the propensity to be violent do become more violent when they watch television. But the most stunning thing we found was how early violence is created in people. We first discovered this through a study in New Zealand. Every one of a thousand children born in the city of Dunedin in the South Island of New Zealand has been followed from birth in the year 1972 through to the present day. When the children were three years old, nurses watched them play for 90 minutes. And simply watching them in play, they divided them into two groups, what they called normal children and at-risk children. And by age three, those the nurses had identified as being at risk, two and a half times as many had two or more criminal convictions. 55% of those were committing violent offences compared with 18% in the normal group. And 47% were abusing their partners, five times as many as those in the normal group. Among the females, very few became conduct disorder compared with the males, but of those who did, 30% in the at-risk group had teenage births, and 43% of those were in violent, abusive relationships. And nurses were able to pick out these risks 18 years in advance by watching three-year-old children play. As the researchers said, immature mothers with no strong parenting skills and violent partners had already borne the next generation of at-risk children, what Mark described as the intergenerational cycle of violence. We see it here in graphs by Professor Richard Trombley of the University of Montreal. He looked at the patterns of violence from when babies were 18 months old to teenage violent offenders. And already by age one and a half to three and a half, the most violent, uh, aggressive babies are 10 times more aggressive than the most peaceful children, bearing out the Dunedin picture that violent personalities are actually created very early in life. So what are the factors that make this happen? The infant brain has 10 trillion synapses at birth. That's a lot of synapses or connections. By age three, that's grown to 200 trillion, 20 times more. I've done the arithmetic many times and Believe this, next time you see a baby, I tell you it's true, 
every second of a baby's life from zero to three, it is adding 1.7 million new connections per second. That is far too many to be created by the genetics. We don't have enough genes in the body to create that. It's being created by the experiences the baby is having. The experiences of love, care and nurturing, or the experiences of anger, violence and neglect. There are critical windows of time during that period when various aspects of the brain are being created, the visual cortex, the, the auditory systems in the baby, the emotional brain is largely created in the first 18 months of life. During that time, the impact of abuse is particularly pernicious. These are pictures, CAT scans of two three-year-old children. The one on the left is a normal three-year-old. The one on the right is one which has suffered extreme neglect. It is an extreme example, but you can see not only a much smaller brain, but dark areas which ha do not show up in the CAT scan because they failed to develop because of abuse of the child during that period. By the way, I'm not saying this is true for all uh, abused or neglected children. It is simply an extreme version. But there is no question the huge damage that's done, smaller hippocampus which controls emotions, smaller limbic system controlling memory, sorry, hippocampus controls memory, uh, limbic system controls uh, emotions, both much smaller in abused and neglected children than in normal children. What is critical in this period was told to us at the beginning of the day by Donna, Donna Jones. She described the importance of the cooing, the talking, the speaking to babies. And there are innumerable reports that have been produced identifying the critical importance of attunement, bonding, the relationship between parent and baby in these earliest years. Alan Shore is a psychiatrist at UCLA in California who is blessed with eidetic memory. What that means is he can read any document and remember it word perfect for the rest of his life. I sure wish I did that when I was at school. Armed with that incredible ability, Alan immersed himself for 10 years in reading every scientific paper that he could find in the fields of neurobiology, psychology, and infant development. And at the end of that 10 years, a trustee of Wave Trust called Richard Bowlby, Richard Bowlby is the son of a man called John Bowlby, who's the father of the science of attachment, asked Alan, if you had to summarize in one sentence everything you learned in those 10 years, what would that one sentence be? And this is what Alan Shore came up with. The child's first relationship, the one with the mother, it doesn't have to be the mother, it's the prime carer, acts as a template which permanently molds the individual's capacity to enter into all later emotional relationships. An infant brain needs time to mature. How the baby does that during this early sensitive period is it aligns its emotional state with the mind of the caregiver. It's done through eye gaze, uh, facial expressions, nonverbal signals. And that starts to create the structure of the brain on which the emotional uh, brain develops thereafter. Just how crucial the first year is to a child's future development is emerging here at Dundee University. So what we're going to do is get you just to interact with Fraser, just as you normally would with him sitting here and kind of smile mm -hmm. and talk and things like that. And then Dr. Suzanne Zedike has spent the past six years still. trying to understand what babies need for healthy development. The latest research shows that it's the quality of interaction between a child and a carer that's crucial, particularly during the first year. <laughs> okay? Hey. All right. Hey. Uh, oh. So if you see, we've got this looking conversation going on. Baby's looking at mum's face, eye, eye gaze is really tight, smiling, really intense kind of looking here. Okay, so we've got a conversation going on. Hi, is that good? <laughs> what the baby is getting from this, this kind is of a interaction is it's learning that, um, that what it's doing uh, has an impact on what other people are doing. So that when it looks at mom, mom looks back at it.
that's the sort of thing that although it looks very, very subtle, it doesn't look like a lot, it's these kinds of things that are crucial to interaction at this age. To show how a child's sense of well-being is dependent upon the quality of interaction, Dr. Zedike has asked this mother to stop responding to her baby. The child's reaction demonstrates what happens if it does not receive this kind of stimulation. So here, mum's face is now being held still. She's not responding to what the baby's doing. And you can start to see the discomfort of the baby. See how it looks away? It now looks really withdrawn and kind of despondent. It checks back with mum. She doesn't smile. It tries. It even tries a smile. She doesn't respond. Its smile goes away. The baby's looking down. It's not even trying to interact. If this goes on and on and on over a long term, you're going to get a withdrawn child who doesn't understand that other people will interact with it. And if it doesn't understand that other people interact with it, you don't have a healthy person. This is research by Professor Daniel Shaw at the University of Pittsburgh. He measured the quality of interaction between mother and baby at 10 to 12 months, and then followed those children in his study for six years afterwards. You can see here the higher levels of problems which occurred through those six years in the children whose parents had poor attunement. I just stress Mark's point earlier. We're not saying this is deterministic. We're not saying every child with misattunement will have these outcomes, but statistically, there will be much higher levels of these outcomes in the children who don't get good attunement in the early years. Attunement is part of the process by which babies learn to create good relationships throughout life. When parents fail to attune in the proper way with babies, they're on the pathway to poor relationships throughout life. Empathy develops through attunement. And our work in violence has taught us that empathy is the single greatest inhibitor of propensity to be violent. If I asked you to start hitting your neighbor hard right now, most of you would stop after the first time on the thought that actually you wouldn't be happy about the pain you were causing to your neighbor. That's because most of you have empathy. But I know from my work in prisons with violent offenders that when they describe to me smashing people's jaws, busting their ribs, they have no more feeling for the pain of the, the victims than I worry about the pain of this lectern when I wrap it with my, nickels, uh, with my knuckles. Um, babies show empathy by one year of age, but not all babies develop this. Abused toddlers react negatively or aggressively, where it may even attack babies who are crying, because that's what they've learned fr from, from their parents. Absence of empathy is characteristic of violent criminals. And the worst psychopaths have no emotion at all. How often have you read in the newspaper or seen on television the phrase, the accused showed no emotion? The accused showed no remorse. They show no emotion and no remorse because they didn't experience emotion or remorse when they were tiny babies. And that leads us to attachment. Basically, our population is divided into two types. Those who develop secure attachment, where the child becomes confident and resilient and has the basic skills for good relationships in life. That applies to 60 to 65% of our population, and it primes children to be good pro-social citizens for life. 35 to 40% develop insecure attachment, children who will struggle with relationships through life. And the sequelae of insecure attachment, again, I'm not being deterministic, but in broad statistical terms, include all of these negative effects here. Low self-esteem, poor self-confidence, depression, aggression, violence, hostile and aggressive behavior at schools, pessimistic and negative, lack of emotional self-control, alienation from others. The worst form is disorganized attachment, which affects 15% of the general population. This occurs when a person's experience of relationships is so inconsistent or unreliable, they're simply unable to develop a coping strategy. The, the parent terrifies the child, but they also have to look to the parent for safety. They simply become someone who is never safe in relationship. These are some of the outcomes that are found with children with disorganized attachment. Higher levels of no the normal of mental illness, children being taken into care, poor relationships, 
disruptive behavior in preschool and school, aggression and violence. Well, what about Hampshire and the Isle of Wight? We have 300,000 people in Hampshire and the Isle of Wight, I include Portsmouth and Southampton in this, with disorganized attachment. A very large number, a large pool from which to develop mental illness, social problems, and uh, violence and aggression. And every year, every year we're adding nearly 3,000 neutral children with disorganized attachment to our population. Every week, we are adding 55 new children who are going to go through life carrying the burdens of disorganized attachment through their life. And it is preventable. It is preventable. So let's not just deal with the symptoms after the event. Let's prevent ACEs before they start. I've got a cost in here to Hampshire and the Isle of Wight of preventing child maltreatment. It shows 124 million pounds per annum being created by children with these problems in the Isle of Wight and, and Hampshire. But that's based on an analysis which came up with a figure which is one third of the level that Mark showed for the cost of ACEs. So if actually we talked about the cost of all ACEs, not just child maltreatment, we'd be looking at a figure of not 124 million but 360 million or more per year being created. It is good economics to invest in the prevention of ACEs. But unfortunately, we do not do it to the level we could because the costs of ACEs are generally held by parts of government, both national and local, which are not those that need to make the investment in the first place, which largely need to take place in health. Article 19 of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child states that we should be protecting all children from all forms of physical or mental violence, injury or abuse, neglect or negligent treatment or maltreatment. We should be doing that. We're not doing that. The World Health Organization produced in, I think it was 2015, the European Report on Preventing Child Maltreatment. They pointed out that governments across Europe are failing to prevent child maltreatment and they called for every government in Europe to create a strategy for preventing child maltreatment before it happened. We and WAVE approached the Department of Health and offered to work in partnership with them to create a UK-wide strategy for preventing child maltreatment. The Department of Health told us it wasn't their business. It's the work of the Department of Education to deal with child maltreatment in England. So we spoke to the, the Department for Education and we asked the Department for Education if they were willing to work with us to create a, a UK strategy as part of the European WHO call, a strategy for prevention of child maltreatment. The Department of Education wrote back to us and said it was none of their business. It's the business of local authorities to take part to take care of prevention. We've spoken to many local authorities about a strategy to prevent child maltreatment and other ACEs. Only one at the moment has agreed to work with us on this, the London Borough of Camden, who are doing wonderful work in this respect. In every other case, we've been told by local authorities that they would love to do it, but they can't afford to. They don't have enough money, and we all know that, go that local government has been stripped of tens of millions of pounds over the last decade or more by national government and all are struggling with funding. And they repeatedly tell us that they are compelled by statute to attend to dealing with the consequences after child abuse and neglect rather than preventing it before it happens. I don't care who is responsible. Somebody needs to take responsibility for this. And in the United Kingdom right now, we are utterly failing to do so. This is a report by a man called Alan, Alan Gregoire. Some of you will have heard of Alan. Alan lives in Winchester. He's a child psychiatrist. He's the chair of the Maternal Mental Health Alliance, and he was the clinical director for mental health and learning disability in NHS Southern. He has identified that current child protection processes fail to detect 90% of the cruelty being experienced by children. 
Alan's comment is that current attempts to tackle child abuse and neglect through dealing with the issue after the event is a form of madness. He explains in his report why he believes it's a form of madness. It is madness not to prevent it before it happens rather than letting it happen and trying to solve it afterwards. And if we look at the age at which abuse mainly takes place, on the left-hand side, based on children in the Child Protection Register, you see the age when the greatest levels of child abuse take place are with children under one. And age two is the next highest level of child abuse and neglect. Exactly that period when the baby's brain is the most sensitive, the most prone to damage by allowing it to happen during that age. Again, I say it is criminal that we allow this to happen to large numbers of babies in our year, in our country, every year. And it goes on and it goes on. If you, in our 2005 report, you'll see uh, as an appendix called A Tale of Ten Children. It tells of ten children between 1945 and 2005 where there were public inquiries into the horrendous child abuse they were treated to. And every public inquiry ended up by saying, we must stop this happening. And we have not stopped it happening. It is still happening. Every year, there have been more this year, we see these cases of horrendous child abuse being carried out, and we keep saying it must stop, and we don't stop it. Why? Because we keep tackling the symptoms, we don't tackle the root causes. So what to do to ensure we shape the most healthy worldview for Hampshire's children? WAVE has been involved in producing two major reports to tackle this. This is one which took us four years, which looked into the root causes of homelessness, drug and alcohol addiction, mental health problems, long-term unemployment, aggression, and criminality. We found two simple solutions to tackling the problem. Prevention focused on prevention of ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. And by prevention, I'm talking about primary prevention before they happen, not waiting till they're teenagers. And implementing trauma-informed care throughout our public services. And it's wonderful. And I have a huge thank you to give to Donna and everybody in Portsmouth, Southampton, Hampshire and the Isle of Wight, who are now implementing on a large scale the training of thousands of people in trauma-informed care, because at least we're doing that part of the challenge very well in Hampshire with real commitment. And, and I've come across so many hundreds of people in the training that we've done uh, who are now committed to implementing this across Hampshire. But we are not yet doing the prevention part, and we need to do that also. The second report is called Building Great Britons. You'll find it on WAVE's website. It was the re report result of a study carried out by the all-party parliamentary group for conception to age two, in which we took e evidence from experts, uh, from charities such as the NSPCC, Save the Children, um, and, and many, many others, and academics across the UK on what needed to be done to give children the best start in life. The study concluded that the cost of failing to deal adequately with perinatal mental health and child maltreatment was £23 billion a year, as I say, somewhat less than Mark's study, which looked more widely at ACEs. That's more than two-thirds of the annual defence budget. And the conclusion of the study, written by the former children's minister, Tim Loughton, was that tackling it should be no less a priority for our politicians and our health and social care professionals than defense of the realm. They concluded that poor attachment leads to poor social and physical development and behavior problems. And Tim wrote in his overview on the report, society prospers and is an enriching environment in which to live according to the nature of its citizens. And the more our citizens are healthy, well-educated, empathic, pro-social, hardworking, and contributing to the cost of society, the better society will live. And I say, to a large extent, we create these citizens in the first three years of a child's 
life. And yet, it's something we are failing to do. We're still churning out in large numbers the damaged, the children who will be antisocial, the children who will be the future violent offenders, the people who will end up in prison. Tim goes on. As there is a rise in the proportion of citizens who are damaged, physically or mentally ill, poor at relationships, antisocial, violent or criminal, and placing a drain on society's resources, so the quality of society worsens. The groundwork for good citizenship occurs in the first 1,001 days. A society which delivers this for its children creates a strong foundation for almost every aspect of its future. A society which fails to deliver it generates enormous problems for the future in terms of social disruption, inequality, mental and physical health problems, and cost. When the Scottish Parliament carried out a nine-month study into the benefits of early years prevention, and I was part of that study, at the end of it, the Scottish Health and Economics Minister, Tom McCabe, stood up on the floor of the Scottish Parliament and he said, over that nine months, we have heard evidence stacked from the floor to the sky that investing in primary prevention is the right thing to do. And Tim Loughton wrote in his report, that message and the need for government to act on it was echoed over and over again in the evidence presented to the Commission of Inquiry to the All-Party Parliamentary Group in the UK. What are the report's conclusions? Conclusion one, local policies need to be based on a commitment to primary prevention. Conclusion two, without intervention, there will continue to be high intergenerational transmission of disadvantage, inequality, dysfunction, and child maltreatment. Recommendations. The priority given to the first 1,001 days should be elevated to the same level as defence of the realm. Recommendation two, require local authorities and others to prioritise all factors leading to the development of socially and emotionally capable children at age two by adopting a 1,001 days strategy and showing how they intend to implement it over a five-year period. Recommendation four, demonstrate delivery of a sound primary prevention approach as outlined in detail in part two of the Building Great Britain's report. Recommendation five, prevent child maltreatment and promote secure attachment. We have identified and Camden is implementing a Spanish program, PCPS, which cuts in half levels of disorganized attachment and levels of insecure attachment. At least it has done in both Spain, where it's run for 20 years, and Ireland, where it ran for 15 years. Mark mentioned nurse-family partnership as one of the things that are delivering, family nurse partnership, as we call it in the UK, delivering the benefits of prevention of ACEs. I brought that program to the UK. I brought that new program to the UK in 2006. This Spanish program has even greater potential to benefit children in the UK than Family Nurse Partnership, which together with Roots of Empathy, another programme we've brought to the UK, has now benefited over 80,000 children and families in the UK. I would love to see Hampshire and the Isle of Wight following in Camden's footsteps and adopting this programme. It's a programme which is delivered universally to children between birth and 18 months of age. Every three months, the parents and the baby visit the children's centre or family centre and receive 90 minutes of support in how to bring up their babies. Feedback from nurses who delivered the programme say, we repeatedly saw a big change in babies between visit one visit and the next. It supports the emotional development of the child as well as the, as the physical. Speech and language challenges were identified much more often and more quickly. The negative scores of the most challenged families decreased time after time as they visited these centres. We steered them on the right pathway to secure attachment. It's much better at picking up abuse and issues of emotional development. It's more exciting, so research-based, so much more comprehensive in scope. If 10 different women came to PCPS, there would be 10 different approaches because the programme is so flexible, so 
shaped to the needs of each individual family. It reduces ACEs and reduces risk. It's gold dust for outcomes. We persuaded three senior managers from Camden to go out to Valencia and watch this program in operation. These are the comments that they made after they'd seen it in work. Debbie Adams, the head of early years in Camden, said, I've seen PCPS in operation in Valencia in a small town en route to Valencia. I was blown away by what I saw. Jane Hutchison, the operations manager for several years, said, it was amazing. It was highly preventative. Debbie said, it helps parents to become the best parents they possibly could be. It puts the expenditure before and not after. Thank you. And Wave has been on record, it's in my biography, as saying the most important profession in the United Kingdom are health visitors. I always remember when John Carnachan, the, the real-life taggart of uh, the, the Scottish police in Glasgow, in an election campaign in Glasgow, was all the political parties were saying, let's have a thousand extra policemen, let's have a thousand extra policemen. Uh, as part of their election campaign. And John Cab Taggart was spread across the front pages of the Glasgow Herald saying, if you want to reduce crime, give me 1,000 health visitors rather than 1,000 police officers. So I'm delighted to, introduce, <laughs> delighted to introduce our next speaker, Charlotte Gatehouse, a specialist health visitor who's going to speak to us. Charlotte, thank you. <laughs> 